today's video is about Plato's dialogue, The Apology. It depicts in a dramatic form the trial of Socrates in Athens in 399 BC. It consists mostly of Socrates' speech in his own defense. It's surely stylized, based in what Socrates actually said, but it's so beautifully constructed from a dramatic point of view that rhetoricians have studied it more than philosophers have. That's not to say there isn't important philosophical content, there certainly is. In the first part of his speech, Socrates does three things. First of all, he explains what kind of speech he wants to make and what he thinks a good speech consists in. Second, he outlines his plan for his own defense. And third, he rejects the popular impression that people have of who he is and what he does. Socrates is depicted in a variety of works, like Aristophanes' The Clouds, as something of a comic, ridiculous figure. And Socrates wants to make it clear to the audience that he isn't that person, that he, what he does is not at all what the dramatists depict and what popular impressions of him are. On the question of the kind of speech Socrates wants to make, he explains that nothing the prosecution has said is true. He's been accused of corrupting the youth of Athens, of undermining belief in the gods. And he says, look, none of that is true. I don't corrupt the youth. I don't undermine belief in the gods. In fact, I don't even investigate the kinds of questions of natural science and other things that people talk about when they talk about the gods and what they do and the divine activities of these gods as explaining natural phenomena. He says, look, I have nothing to do with that. I ask people questions about virtue. I ask them whether they know what they're talking about. And I simply ask people questions. I don't investigate these things, so I can't be guilty of all of that. I don't do any of that. He makes it clear that his intention is to speak the unvarnished truth, the truth no matter what. And that's really what the excellence of a speech consists in. The point of speaking is to tell the truth. And he says no speech, no matter how beautifully constructed, can be a good speech if it tells a series of lies, nor can it be a bad speech if it conveys the truth, even if it does so clumsily. Now Socrates says that in the course of his questioning of people, he isn't seeking to corrupt anyone, he isn't seeking to undermine anything. What he's doing is asking people questions. He says, I don't actually have a view about these things, I don't claim to know what virtue is, what knowledge is. I don't claim to know the answers of any of these questions. In fact, I think my distinctive virtue, he says, is precisely that I don't know these things and don't think I know them, but other people do think they know them. And so I ask them about them. I seek for them to teach me. So I don't try to impose my views on them. I want to absorb their views once I understand what they are. He goes around and asks people questions, he says, in order to eliminate his own ignorance and to find out what it is that they know. Now, he does say that in the course of doing this, he's been surprised. He's found out that these people pretend to know, but that they know nothing. And so actually, they're no better off than he is. He knows nothing, they know nothing, but they claim to know something, they pretend to know it. He at least admits that he doesn't know it. And so he says, I at least have the virtue of correctly depicting my own state of knowledge, I correctly admit that I'm ignorant, but they cover that up. Now, in the second section of the Apology, Socrates defends himself against the specific charges that are being brought by the prosecutor, Miletus. And in doing that, he says, I am not corrupting the youth of Athens, and I'm certainly not trying to undermine belief in the gods. In fact, I am carrying out a divine command, because I went to the oracle at Delphi, and Apollo said that I was the wisest person alive. He said, well, I was completely baffled by this. What could this possibly mean? Apollo could not be wrong, and yet I don't know anything. How could I be the wisest person? And so he was baffled, and he thought, I, th this is confusing. I don't know what the good is. I don't know what it is for something to be beautiful or just or even to constitute knowledge. And so, how could this be true? And so, he went around Athens asking people questions, trying to understand what this claim about his own wisdom could possibly mean. So, Socrates thought, 
Look, it certainly doesn't seem to me to be true that I am the wisest person alive. A lot of these other people seem much wiser. They seem to know what things like courage and self-control and friendship and love are. So I'm going to go around and ask them what they are. Perhaps I will learn and I'll find out that they are truly wiser than I and that I had better reinterpret what the Oracle at Delphi said. Or maybe I will find out something about my own wisdom and try to understand what Apollo had in mind. So he goes around and asks these people questions and he was shocked to find out they don't actually know what courage is or self-control or love or friendship or any of these other things. It turns out they are as ignorant as he is, but they pretend to know. And so he begins to realize, aha, here is my wisdom. It's a higher order wisdom. They know nothing, but they think they know things. I know nothing, but at least I know that I know nothing. Socrates concludes, these people think they know something, but in fact they don't. They know nothing. Socrates says, I admit I know nothing, but at least I don't think I know anything. I admit I don't know anything. And so that's what my wisdom consists in, understanding that I know nothing. Now, as for the charge of corrupting the youth, Socrates says, I certainly do not try to do that. I've been asking people questions, and yes, young people listen to me, and they too are surprised to find out that these people who are thought to be wise don't in fact know anything. But Socrates says, look, I am the one who's taking moral education seriously. I'm the one who's trying to make them better people by taking them to people who are thought to be wise and seeking illumination from them. So I'm certainly not trying to undermine the sense of morality of the youth, I'm trying to build it up. And if it turns out that I'm in some way doing them harm, it's certainly unintentional. Well, if I'm harming someone unintentionally, then by all means, the right response is to instruct me, to explain this, not to punish me. I'm not trying to do this. And so Socrates says, I certainly de don't deserve any punishment. I'm trying to do a good thing. If I'm somehow failing, then point out how and help me to stop doing it. In the third section, Socrates explains what he does. He explains the process of the Socratic method, of the Elenchus, and he tries to indicate what he's trying to accomplish. Now, in the process of doing this, he does make a number of ethical claims. And I think it's important to recognize this because although Socrates thinks he knows nothing, actually a lot of characteristic ethical theses emerge from Socrates' defense. So it's worth looking at what some of those are. One of them is that ethics takes precedence over prudence. That is to say, we should not act merely in our own self-interest. We should always be thinking about what is right. We should focus on virtue and rightness, not simply on what is best for us. He says there's no way to know whether death is a good thing or a bad thing, that it's disgraceful to pretend to know what you don't in fact know, and that the best way to succeed is to pursue virtue. Well, the jury then votes and convicts Socrates by a narrow margin. At that point, Socrates responds and gives a speech in which he includes some of his most characteristic statements. So let me report some of those. I sought to persuade every man among you that he must look to himself and seek virtue and wisdom before he looks to his private interests, and look to the state before he looks to the interests of the state, and that this should be the order which he observes in all his actions. So there is the claim that ethics overrides prudence. Think about what is right, not about what is beneficial to yourself. I never wrong anyone intentionally, says Socrates. The greatest good of man is daily to converse about virtue. And finally, the most famous statement of all, the unexamined life is not worth living. The trial then proceeds to the penalty phase, and the prosecution demands the death penalty. Now Socrates says, look, I." I have done nothing to deserve the death penalty. He has an opportunity here to propose an alternative penalty. That was the way justice was set up in Athens. And so he said, I, I haven't done anything wrong. In fact, I've been trying to get all of you to focus on virtue and justice and in general, what is right every day. 
and to converse about these things every day. That's a good thing. I've been going around benefiting you. So what should happen to me? He said, well, the same thing that should happen to someone who has benefited you. Olympic athletes, for example, benefit you, but they just give you the appearance of happiness. They give you a momentary happiness when you watch them and see them compete. He said, I give you real happiness. So what should be done to me? I should get the same kind of reward that Olympic athletes get. I should get a free lunch every day in the same place where they all gather and are honored. Now, Socrates' friends, seeing the reaction of the jury here, realize uh, this is a terrible idea, Socrates. Don't propose this. Um, look, uh, you're really getting people angry. They may be reluctant to sentence you to death. A lot of them were reluctant to find you guilty. But this suggestion angers them. So they convince him to propose a small fine as an alternative to the death penalty. Well, the jury now votes again, and it decides in favor of the death penalty by a much larger margin than it had even voted for his guilt. So presumably there were a certain number of people in the jury who simply said, yeah, I don't think he's guilty, but he's so annoying, I'm willing to sentence him to death. It's quite a remarkable achievement in a way that the speech produces that result. Well, before being led away, Socrates says a number of other things of real ethical significance. No evil can happen to a good man, either in life or after death. Now, that's a surprising claim. Nothing evil can happen to you. But he's using that term, evil, in a moral sense. He's saying, sure, people can do bad things to you. They can make you suffer. They can even kill you. But they can't make you bad. They can't destroy your soul. They can't do something that turns you from a good person to a bad person. Only you can do that. When my sons are grown up, I would ask you, oh my friends, to punish them, and I would have you trouble them as I've troubled you, if they seem to care about riches or anything more than virtue. Or if they pretend to be something, when they're really nothing, then reprove them as I've reproved you, for not caring about that for which they really ought to care, and thinking that they're something when they're really nothing. And if you do this, I and my sons will have received justice at your hands. Finally, as Socrates is being led away, he says this, which closes the dialogue. The hour of departure has arrived, and we go our ways. I to die, and you to live. Which is better? Only God knows.